Michael. Good afternoon, friends and newcomers to our Friday Special Conversations with Special People lecture series. I'm so happy to introduce our very special guest today. City University of New York and who has also taught at Columbia University School of Journalism. He's been such a wonderful friend to all of us throughout the years. He's been speaking at our library so many times for more than 10 years and whenever asked always says of course no matter how busy he is i never have to worry what his topic will be either and he never gives me the topic either as because it's he's written so many fascinating and informative articles throughout the years and we've learned so much from his research and his talent as a great reporter so i am just going to say i will he, i will be as surprised as everyone else whatever he would choose to say He's wonderful at it, and I'm so happy that you came, Andy. I really appreciate it so much. It gives me great pleasure now to introduce our very special guest and friend, Andy Laren. Oh, Phyllis, thank you so much. It's great. It's great to see everyone. I hope that everyone is doing well in these uh, in these difficult times. So, uh, and I look forward to uh, being able to do this with you all next year in person, whenever is convenient. I know, Phyllis, you. You tend to have me here like every six months or so. Right. So, so you, you've ha you've had me talk about uh, a lot of stories that I've done throughout the years, uh, whether at the New York Times, where we've, you know, worked on like our Pulitzer winning investigation that examined uh, unregulated Chinese chemicals coming into the world's pharmaceutical supply and killing people, whether it's been examining the Snowden files or the WikiLeaks trove of diplomatic cables and some of the other investigations we've done throughout the years. Um, so since I was last here about six months or so ago, I thought what I would talk about is some of the stories that we've been working on in the last six months. I know that many of you may wish to talk about the elections and the ballot counting and things like that. Uh, I am not currently involved in the ballot counting stories. Um, because I work on the investigative team where we tend to work on lo more longer range pieces, but I'm certainly familiar with it. And I've been on standby in case it had gotten, uh, whether if it goes uh, completely off the rails, then uh, then I'll be brought in. But right now we just have our, our regular political crew uh, doing those stories, but I'll be happy at the end to answer questions about that process and about how news organizations go about doing these kind of like election day stories. Um, but since that's not what I've been doing day in and day out the last six months, I thought I'd talk about some of those. So if I may, I'm gonna actually share my screen so that you don't have to be subjected at looking at me, but could have perhaps instead be looking at some of the stories um, that we've been working on. So should the share go right? Um, I'm going to talk first, uh, kind of go in chronological order. Um, so uh, in the spring, uh, we were uh, the, the the coronavirus uh, pandemic was uh, was clearly getting worse. So I just want to try to bring you into what was going on in our newsroom. So I'm I'm at NBC <coughs> now, and uh, as you might imagine, we have we're a newsroom of thousands and thousands of people, and with the pandemic, us, like every other news organization, we were no longer going into the newsroom. Very few people go into the newsroom these days. It's essentially, uh, you know, Lester Holt and company uh, to do the Today Show or, or nightly news, but largely it's a skeleton crew that's in 30 Rock. And instead, uh, all of us are working uh, at our homes or wherever we may have relocated. So I'm here in South Orange and very glad to be here. Um, by the way, I hope all of you are doing well in these difficult times, but let me bring you to one of the very first stories that we did with the pandemic. Um, this was one that we did uh, before people fully realized how badly prepared our nation and its hospitals were for dealing with a pandemic. Um, there had been a few anecdotal accounts of a few hospitals or a few doctors 
um, saying that they felt like they did not have adequate equipment to deal with the pandemic. We really wanted to put our arms around it on a big way. And one of the tools we deployed to do that was, um, was surveying uh, uh, techniques. And so we actually surveyed several hundred healthcare workers around the country, rural hospitals, big city hospitals, East Coast hospitals, Midwest hospitals, <laughs> West Coast. We interviewed uh, nurses and doctors um, and, and got survey results uh, from around the country. And this was, uh, I think, the first major story that explored just how badly prepared our medical system was for dealing with a pandemic. Um, the, the interviews that we did, myself and my colleagues on this story, were heartbreaking. Um, the, the stress that our nurses and doctors were going under was enormous. We did this story in uh, mid-March. Um, and uh, um, we had spoken with, uh, with workers in Michigan, in New Jersey. Um, they were describing a system that was tragically broken where you know, people were brought, being brought into hospitals and you know, uh, there, were, there was no room in the uh, ICUs, in the emergency rooms and that basic supplies were, had run out and that nurses were having to wear masks that were not the right masks to wear. Um, and they, they were being told by their hospitals not to talk about this. So it was very difficult to get this information. And we're very glad that, uh, that there were people brave enough to tell us about the difficulties that, they were, that we were facing. And this is actually, you know, um, if, if this story seems dated to you, I, I'd just like to remind you that, you know, as we look at testing numbers increasing right now in, in our part of the world and in other parts of uh, the United States, this is actually the fear that we continue to have is that we only have a certain number of hospital beds in America and we went beyond our capacity during the pandemic. And uh, right now we're seeing some of the highest uh, positive case figures. And so the real concern among medical workers is that if people do not socially distance, if we do not wear masks, these are essentially our fire breaks in the pandemic. Um, so if we wear masks, if we socially distance, we can prevent the, uh, the stress that's put on our nation's hospitals. We can slow down the number of patients that might be seen by them. So, you know, if you care about your local nurse, um, one of the upshots that we certainly learned in this story, if you really care about the doctors and nurses in our country, put on a mask, um, socially distance. Um, that's certainly the message that they were conveying. The amount of stress these people were under, we, I mean, I remember interviewing doctors and nurses, you know, they would get off their shifts at like midnight on a Saturday night, and they were so upset about what they were seeing, they actually would get on the phone with us and tell us about what they were seeing in their hospitals um, and how they were so ill prepared. I'll talk more about preparedness later in some of the other stories that we've done, but this was just one of the first ones we did, and again, you know, to do a big story like this with everyone under stress, with everyone in the newsroom scattered around, you know, no longer working directly in the office. This was a little bit of a logistic feat and we've been trying to get better at this as we've gone on as far as handling the logistics of these stories. Um, but uh, certainly using techniques like surveys have allowed us to, you know, get big picture uh, looks at what's going on. Uh, one of the other things we did is when we're doing investigative stories, one of our tried and true techniques are, are to just mine public records, mine government records and see what we see. And one of the things that was fascinating was that um, foreign governments were suddenly lining up in, in February and March, hire, hiring high-end lobbyists to pressure Washington on issues related to the coronavirus. So one of the things that they would be are fighting against is uh, perception. So like Japan felt like, uh, oh my gosh, you know, we're having a pandemic. People might perceive Japan as like a pandemic capital or South Korea was 
uh, trying to lobby against travel restrictions. So we actually saw these in foreign lobbying records that are filed in Washington. So myself and one of our State Department reporters, a wonderful guy named Dan DeLuce, uh, we did this story looking at how foreign lobbying was increasing in Washington and, uh, and why that was occurring. So again, mining public records and seeing how different countries around the world were lobbying the Trump administration, uh, uh, sometimes successfully on, on, uh, on restrictions. Uh, one of the things that was also fascinating was when you comb through federal records, you could see that the Trump administration was using the pandemic as cover to do things uh, that it claimed were coronavirus related, but clearly were not. And one, one bright shining example was environmental regulation. Uh, the, the Trump administration was using the pandemic as a uh, mm -hmm as cover to, to loosen up uh, environmental regulations involving um, uh, uh, methane, involving other uh, anti-pollution measures. They were also loosening restrictions on banks and on, on energy companies, uh, um, all being done in the name of the, of, uh, of uh, the pandemic. So what we did is we, we actually checked every single day and particularly um, about two weeks into the pandemic, you could clearly see that there was a branch of the Trump administration that all of a sudden was rapidly escalating um, the filings that were happening, um, you know, to, uh, uh, I think we did the story in on April 7th. So this is less than a month into the pandemic. And at that point, there had already been more than 200 proposed rule changes by the Trump administration. And that was only escalating exponentially every day. So, uh, so we, we did this by carefully documenting each and every rule change that was being uh, proposed. Um, so you could see some were pandemic related like clamping down on the hoarding of protective equipment um, and others were looking at the licensing requirements for healthcare workers, but others had nothing to do with, uh, with the pandemic. So um, that's what, uh, that was one of the stories we did as we examined what Washington was doing in the wake of the pandemic. The other thing we did is you may recall that uh, in, uh, in the spring, and now this is being revisited again where there, where there may be even more, but there were a series of measures that were enacted by Congress and the Trump administration to try to ease the economic stress that America was feeling. Um, and this was happening in a bunch of different ways. And so one of the things that we did was we started tracking every dollar um, and every proposal. So uh, you may recall that it, at one point um, early on in, uh, I believe it was late March or early April, the Trump administration had said that if you had a coronavirus related medical bill, that you would not have to worry about it. You know, we're a country that has a very crazy patchwork of insurance uh, regulations. Um, you know, we have uh, uh, millions of Americans who do not have any insurance. That of course is creating a, a lot of concern about the pandemic and the spread because if people don't have insurance, they may not be going to doctors when they get sick with coronavirus. And if they do that, then of course, then they're more likely to be spreading the disease among friends and neighbors and work colleagues. So the Trump administration uh, had said that if you have COVID, don't worry, it'll be covered. Just go to the hospital, get the medical care you need. Um, but they did it through uh, executive orders rather than through legislation. And that um, of course does not carry the full force of law and so we started doing a lot of checking and what we realized is that uh, um, that wasn't really the case, that, uh, that you could go to the, your doctor or your hospital and then you could get socked with a bill for hundreds or thousands of dollars. And uh, we actually started checking around the country to, to document this. Um, and uh, you know, New Yorkers in, 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 who went to the hospital in March were all of a sudden facing a bill for several thousand dollars, you know, in Louisiana, uh, the insurance uh, industry down there actually was uh, was suing to try to get uh, restrictions lifted so that so that more charges could occur. 
So we started documenting all the different ways that if you thought you were going to be covered for insurance uh, when, it, when it comes to COVID related uh, tests or medical procedures, um, not so fast. Um, then there was the CARES Act, and this was a billion dollar, multi billion dollar program passed by Congress, passed by the Trump administration. It was bipartisan. Um, Democrats and Republicans came, came together on this uh, to, uh, to shore up our nation's economy in the wake of the pandemic. And this is uh, currently being revisited on Capitol Hill after the election results go through. So what do we do as investigative reporters? We follow the money. And uh, while the, the programs were, were passed by Congress, the Trump administration still had a lot of latitude about how they could interpret various spending. And one of the stories we looked at was we started going agency by agency to see how they were actually spending the money. And in the Department of Education, one of the things that they did is they started giving more money to for-profit schools than they were to community colleges, which might seem counterintuitive because if there's anything that reaches all parts of America, it's, it's, our, it's our public community colleges. But instead they were steering money to for-profit proprietary schools, some of whom had dodgy records when it came to, uh, to the kind of education that they were giving students. So we started documenting how that would ha was happening um, it was not easy to do because uh, the way the record keeping was done by the Department of Education, it was not transparent. So we had to do a lot of legwork, um, but we were able to, uh, you know, to name names and document exactly how it was that, uh, that these for-profit schools were getting uh, proportionally more money than, uh, than public schools and particularly community colleges. Um, and, uh, uh, and that also led to uh, to voices to members of Congress saying that this was this really was a concern and not what they intended when they passed um, the CARES Act. Um, so that was following the money, and it was literally going through uh, grant by grant to every single um, uh, uh, all the loans that were given out, um, uh, all the grants that were given out to schools. Then we did the same thing again, where we started following other lending programs. So this is the Paycheck Protection Program. You may be familiar with it. This got a lot of attention. Um, and uh, NBC News, along with a, do other, a dozen other news organizations, we've actually, full disclosure, we've been suing the Trump administration to learn more about these loans. They've been fighting tooth and nail about giving details about these loans. That was particularly surprising because these paycheck protection loans were done through the Small Business Administration. And in the past, both Republican and Democrat presidencies would give us this information. All it took was a simple request. This was a, it was structured in a very similar way than previ as previous uh, business loans. But this time around, uh, the Treasury Department and the SBA we're saying that we cannot get these records. So we've sued and uh, we actually found out yesterday, uh, the district court in Washington DC has uh, said that we deserve to win, that the arguments by, made by the Trump administration were specious, were not founded on fact, and they've ordered the Trump administration to release these uh, further records in our lawsuit. We should be getting them later in November. But there were other ways that loans were being made public and we started mining those records. Um, the administration, by the way, had decided to release some of these records, not all of them. And uh, also some of the loans were given through, uh, given to publicly traded companies, big publicly traded companies. Um, and those companies needed to file information in their securities filings. So we, we followed the paper trail to other sources of documents to get a further window into what was going on while we were also filing our FOIA, joining with other news organizations and, and filing litigation. So we found that there were companies with strong ties to the uh, Trump administration uh, getting these loans, um, which were dirt cheap money. Um, we also uh, found that um, 
you know, that some of the loans, it was questionable how they were getting the loans. So there are these large, you can picture them large multinational corporations that have a series of subsidiaries. So what some subsidiaries were doing, most notoriously, a hotel chain based in uh, Texas, in Dallas, um, that has close ties with the Trump administration. Instead of filing for the loans through the parent company, they would have each of their subsidiaries filing loans. And this way they could max out on the amount of money they could get. So instead of uh, getting just $10 million, which was the federally imposed cap, some companies were poised to get you know, $60, $70 million by filing their loan applications through subsidiaries. So we, we reported on that. Some of those companies were so embarrassed in the publicity that they got afterwards that they actually returned the loans. So that included a restaurant chain in Nashville. And finally, that, uh, that hotel chain in Dallas, they were among the companies that finally just returned the money. Uh, we, also we also started checking all the money that was given to our nation's farmers. Um, that also was a Freedom of Information Act request. The Department of Agriculture was not making this easy on us, but we did get the loan money. And one of the things that that documented was that small farmers were not getting relief under this program. The money instead was going to large um, agribusinesses. And so by following loan by loan, we were able to document how the top 10% of uh, the agribusinesses in America were getting more than half of the money that was in the pot. And if you wanted to talk about small farmers, the bottom 10%, they were getting less than 1% of the hundreds of millions of dollars in agricultural loans that were, uh, that were authorized by Congress as far as, as part of the pandemic release, relief programs. So that's some of the ways that we've been covering the pandemic. I'm just talking about my stories. Myself and other journalists at NBC have also been doing many other stories. I'm just talking about the ones that I've worked on. But uh, again, tried and true measures, following what's in the public record, following the dollar amounts, you know, filing Freedom of Information Act requests. That's how we've been getting our stories. I know sometimes people say like, oh, this is all from, you know, crazy activists and the like. And I just want to tell you, that's not how we go about doing our job. We we check what's in the public record and try to, you know, talk about how our nation's money is being spent and how our nation is preparing for, um, for things like a pandemic. Um, in the course of, uh, of, of the summer, so to, get to, to go into the summertime now, um, there, were, um, <clears throat> there were protests that, um, that stemmed from, uh, uh, from the George, George Floyd uh, uh, killing in Minneapolis. Um, and so again, uh, you know, there were many people covering the protests. The protests of course spread beyond Minneapolis to cities uh, around uh, the country. You know, for those of you who live in Maplewood and South Orange, I'm sure you're aware that there were protests in our community as well. And, um, and you know there are uh, paintings uh, on this on our streets now that that show where a lot of the sentiment is in our community. Again, as investigative reporters, you know we try to follow the public record. And one of the things that we uh, were able to get in Minneapolis, since the the protests all stemmed from the killing of George Floyd, is when George Floyd was killed, he was killed using a very controversial technique that not many, not every police department in the country uses um, as part of their rule book, as part of their policies. So that's neck restraints. So the idea is that um, af uh, as you're re uh, apprehending someone, do you use a neck restraint? And do you use a neck restraint uh, um, after they've been handcuffed? The, the, those are highly controversial techniques. And one of the things we were curious about was, was George Floyd a one-off? Was that just one time where uh, an officer used a neck restraint and he unfortunately happened to die? And the sad reality is, is that he's not a one-off. Um, that just in the last five years alone, um, dozens and dozens of suspects were uh, 
subjected to, uh, to neck restraints in Minneapolis um, and 44 people, according to the police's own records, 44 people were also rendered unconscious when they were subjected to neck restraints. Um, so uh, we got the story by examining public records, by combing through them, and then we spoke with law enforcement experts around the country to say, you know, is this a big number, a small number? And there were many law enforcement experts uh, who were saying this was a very surprising number. Um, and uh, they would not have expected uh, a city like Minneapolis to have so many cases. Um, raising questions about the policies within that city and, uh, and, their, and their use and training of using neck restraints. So, um, and of course, uh, uh, Chauvin's case, uh, the George Floyd case is particularly egregious because um, it's almost impossible to find a city that recommends using neck restraints after somebody has been handcuffed. Um, you know, that is something that uh, is just not in police manual. So, uh, so anyway, so documenting that, um, one of the things we also saw was that as we went through, um, uh, so those were, those were, that story was based on, the previous story, the Minneapolis story was based on public records maintained by the Minneapolis Police Department. One of the other things we found interesting um, was that uh, in reaction to many of the protests uh, around the country, um, you know, police departments were responding in different ways. Not every police department was responding the same way. And that was, of course, really interesting. I've covered police in the past, have had, as have many of my colleagues. Um, and, uh, and I was really curious um, uh, about the, uh, the deployment of military grade uh, vehicles by police departments. So if you're not familiar with this, there's a controversial program by the Pentagon where they essentially give military gear to our nation's police department. Some of it is, you know, it's just the great use of taxpayer dollars. It's just saying, hey, the military is not using it anymore. So we're going to give um, uniforms. We're going to give, you know, shields or, or, you know, pistols or, you know, weapons that, you know, we can save, uh, you know, smaller police departments, you know, having to spend their own money. We'll give them military surplus gear that we're just not using anymore. But then there, there are these high grade armored vehicles that um, uh, that police department have. And what's been controversial is how the departments deploy them. Um, police departments do use them for good reason. Um, you know, big city police departments say that they'll use armored vehicles when they have like a SWAT team like situation, like they have an armed shooter that they know uh, is, uh, is, you know, is trying to shoot at police or is gonna be particularly difficult to arrest, they might bring in a military vehicle um, to protect officers. That makes sense, right? To some degree. Um, that, that also, by the way, to some police departments is also questionable because they, there's this theory about escalation. Like if you bring in an armored, armored vehicle, is it just gonna escalate it? Uh, a, a touchy situation to begin with. So within, within police departments, it's questionable about when you bring in armored vehicles to begin with, but we were finding that, that these vehicles were being brought in when they're just peaceful protests. And there were questions about whether that was exacerbating a tense situation. And to do this story, um, we used public records by mining. Uh, so the, the Pentagon makes public which police departments got MRAPs, military vehicles, the kind of vehicles that you've seen deployed in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, uh, but uh, what we then started doing was checking social media accounts and news accounts. And, uh, and you know, we just found all these situations where these vehicles were deployed some of them, uh, I mean, I think the most, uh, see if it's here. Uh, uh, I'll just show you this video briefly.
Can you tell us because the people who don't have the television on and the, the computer yeah, on. So this is in Salt Lake City. There's an elderly man who's who is at the public library and he's walking with a cane. And so what you're seeing in this video is you're seeing the police coming out of these, uh, if you see on the, uh, 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 in the screenshot here, you see these MRAPs, these military vehicles. They, so these are Pentagon surplus vehicles. They come out of this and they literally start shoving an elderly man who was walking down the street with a cane. Um, they shove him to the ground. And it, they were and here's the old police. guy, and now they're knocking him to the ground. They were local police? They were local police. These are local Salt Lake City police. This was a, there had been a peaceful protest there. Um, that old man, as far as we know, was not even part of the protest. Um, but the police just came and shoved him to the ground. You can see he just fell to the ground right there. And there's no, obviously no one there. And uh, again, you know, it just raises questions about, um, you know, the, what they call disproportionate response. You know, there's a lot of ways you could have dealt with that elderly man walking down that sidewalk. I don't think there's anyone um, who would say that he should have been shoved to the ground by police pouring out of an MRAP. So these are some of the kinds of instances that we were seeing uh, as we were exploring just like how police that got this, these military grade vehicles were responding to protests around the country. Uh, yes, we did finally track him down. Uh, he was not part of the protests. I believe he was actually a Trump supporter, um, just happened to be walking by his local public library in Salt Lake City. Um, so uh, th those were some of the stories that we did in response to the pandemic, in response to the uh, Congress's spending uh, in, to help shore up our economy in the pandemic. Um, but we'd also, you know, as, as, as investigative reporters, we work on long-term stories that don't necessarily have that kind of immediate news hook, but that are, you know, interesting things that we've come across and one of the things that we have found we had found particularly interesting with the Trump administration is, for those who don't know, Turkey is uh, is run by a an autocrat named Erdogan, um, who's been involved in a lot of controversial deals. And the United States, under previous presidents, both Bush and Obama, had had kind of a, a, a bristling relationship with uh, with Erdogan. Trump, on the other hand, has had a very has had a much warmer relationship with Erdogan. Um, it's led to some controversial things. For instance, there's a, uh, a group of Christians in, uh, in Turkey who've been longtime allies of the United States, but that Erdogan does not like. Um, and uh, and uh, Trump, uh, in the course of uh, the way he's handled the Syrian war, allowed Turkish troops to, uh, to essentially uh, have a few days of unfettered shooting and bombings of those uh, of those Christians in Turkey, um, so there have been a lot of controversial policy shifts by the United States um, uh, with regard to Turkey. And one of the things that we came across as part of an upshot of our Ukraine investigations has been that. Uh, uh, the uh, the loosening of of Tur of uh, of the way that the our our country handles Turkey actually began in in the days before uh, Trump took office, um, uh, and it involved some of the very same characters who were involved in uh, in uh, in Tur in Trump's uh, difficulties in Ukraine that led to the his impeachment. And those hearings, so uh, uh, this came apart largely by public records, um, by interviewing people uh, around the world. Uh, we collaborated with several news organizations uh, uh, in Europe uh, and in the United States to do this story. So, uh, if I could just lead you to the beginning of the story, um, 
It was the day before Donald Trump's inauguration and Turkey's top diplomat was looking to make inroads with the new administration. At Washington's Watergate Hotel, Turkey's foreign minister, uh, Shabul Shogul, uh, Shoglu uh, sat down with Brian Ballard, a well-connected lab uh, lobbyist who served as vice tr chairman of Trump's inaugural committee. Also at this table were several other uh, prominent Turkish business officials and also Lev Parnas, a colorful Florida businessman whose back channel dealings with Ukraine two years later would feature, feature prominently in Trump's inauguration. This 2017 meeting has never been before disclosed and mark the start of Turkey's ambitious lobbying of the Trump administration involving back channels um, uh, uh, with Russian linked oligarchs, um, figures in the Ukraine case and more. And so we then go into the documents and the way that we went about reporting this story um, and talking about this ver these various back channels that, that Turkey was using to lobby the Trump administration. Um, so uh, that was just the longer term story that we thought would illuminate this, by the way, for those who are you know, wondering about this, um, uh, Bolton, the uh, former national security uh, advisor to Donald Trump, who's certainly no wilting wallflower. He's a hard line uh, uh, Republican, a uh, longtime Republican. He had also been, uh, he had written in his recent memoir that he felt that uh, the Trump administration's dealing with Turkey was perhaps more egregious than what was going on in Ukraine. So you could you could argue that this was a bipartisan concern among Republicans as well as Democrats. We were just able to document the inroads that Turkey was making and how and how um, deep rooted they were even before uh, Trump took office. Um, another long-term investigation that we were working on involved a cache of secret documents. Uh, this was part of a multinational uh, collaboration with news organizations around the world, the BBC, uh, the biggest newspaper in Japan, uh, leading news organizations in Germany and elsewhere uh, in Canada. Um, we, we collaborated with them because we got hold of a secret cache of banking documents that normally reporters never get to see. And these documents allowed us to have insight into dirty money passing through US banks and seeing it on a scale, you know, trillions of dollars that we've never been able to see before. And one of the stories that I found going through the documents was how North Korea was essentially able to launder money through US banks, including banks here in New York, in California, in Washington, New Jersey, how North Korea was able to launder money through U.S. banks and uh, uh, essentially finance its uh, its its regime there. So um, this was against international sanctions, against U.N. sanctions, European sanctions, U.S. sanctions. But because of uh, the way the banking system works, we were able to document for the first time how perniciously North Korea is able to take advantage of the global financial situation. Uh, to take care of that, it, it, to go through that system and, and launder its money. So this was, again, based on documents. This was leaked through a whistleblower. This is a very difficult story to do. Why was it difficult? Um, going through banking documents is not for the faint of heart. And I got to tell you, I spent most of my year the past year going through these documents and trying to find the best stories we could. So this was one of the stories that we found. Another story that we found was how the bribes involving the Tokyo Olympics and also involving how Russia would bribe Olympic officials to ignore positive drug tests, how those two went through US banks. Um, and we were able to document those bribes. So if you're wondering why Tokyo got to win the 2020 games, which now look like they'll be held next year, if you're wondering, how Russia was able to delay um, sanctions uh, for its doping athletes. A lot of it had to do with bribes that for the first time we were able to trace through these secret banking documents. So these were stories that we did in late September as part of a big leak of documents you might've seen. 
uh, some of the news coverage about those in between all of the campaign coverage. Um, uh, so, uh, and again, mining complicated secret banking documents. Um, and this was just the story that we were doing uh, before the pandemic uh, occurred. If you wanted to know some of the other stories that we had been doing before the pandemic was how, you know, if you ever, if you think that colleges make money off college sports, guess again, there's only a few colleges in the country like University of Alabama that make a profit off college sports like football and basketball. Most colleges lose money most students actually end up having to pay hidden fees to prop up sports. So, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, basketball, you know, or, you know, whether it's Seton Hall basketball or Rutgers football, you know, chances are students, those, those sports programs are not paying their way. Um, it's student fees that are propping them up. And we were able to document that using uh, records obtained under the Freedom of Information Act that we filed FOIAs for all around the country. And here you can see some of the empty stands in the background of a football game. Uh, I think this one was down in Virginia. Um, this was actually, I'm sorry, North Carolina. Uh, again, propped up by student fees. Uh, so big time football. Those were some of the stories that we were doing before all of this craziness that we're currently going through. Oops. So. Those are the stories I wanted to show you. Um, and uh, I know that you guys always have amazing questions. So if you have any questions about any of these stories or if you wanna talk about how uh, large news organizations cover the elections, I'm all, I'm all ears. So let me know what you got. Anthony, you were fabulous. As you're writing and, and the stories, it's so, it has to be very frightening to know what's going on once you find out that it's going on because everyone is living in a dream world and worrying about the top, you know, the top election and all of this is going on with the colleges and, and with the dirty money from North Korea and neck restraints and so forth. I wanted to ask you, you said you were writing out of the house. Did you go to Minneapolis? Did you go to any of these places to interview people or? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I mean, in normal times, we would have gone to those places. Um, with the pandemic, um, we're, we've greatly restricted the travel that we we're doing. So we certainly interviewed the Minneapolis Police Department. We interviewed officers, you know, former officers at the department. We interviewed people in Minnesota who actually do the training at the Minneapolis Police Department. We interviewed officers um, in other departments all around the country. Um, you know, how do you do things in Los Angeles? How do you do things in New York? You know, so that we had a sense that, you know, are these standard policies on how policing is done throughout the United States? Or is this just, you know, is this, you know, is this more controversial? Um, so we certainly interview these people. And the bad news is we don't often get to, uh, to do these in person. Now, the picture of, of the elderly gentleman yes. um, assaulted yes. by the police. Who took that picture? That's and a great question. No. So, yeah, so that video was actually taken by another news organization. So in the course of hoovering up all the different social media postings, um, we went through and you know verified every image, every instance. We spoke with every police department that we reported on. Um, and uh, that particular footage was taken by an ABC affiliate in uh, Salt Lake City, where the police shoved down that man while cameras happened to be rolling. Um, by the way, just, you know, when we talk about social media, you know, there really is a lot of disinformation out there. We found protesters were claiming that, that there were military vehicles being used in their hometown. We found that, ver that some of those photos were actually older photos. They were from two years ago or five years ago. You know, so when we reported on these vehicles, this high grade military hardware being used against George Floyd related protesters, we filtered out the ones that we could not verify. So we only reported on ones where we could document and where police departments confirmed that they were deploying these vehicles on those instances. Thank you. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, great questions. Well, I don't have a question. I just want to express the tremendous gratitude for this really difficult work that goes into right. uncovering this, these critical stories, especially in, the, in these times. Uh, it, it's just, you know, it's, it's really heroic. And I, I just, on a personal note, I, I, you know, your whole profession just really deserves such recognition because so many of these stories, they were so deeply hidden. And, and what you described going through the bank records for a year, such, you know, to, to find, to get these threads together in a way that the public could, you know, meaningfully understand it's never been more important. I mean, I know we all, you know, know this, but I, I thank you. <laughs> oh, well, we, we appreciate it. I mean, thank, I thank you so much for saying that. I know that, you know, this it's, it really is hard work, and of course, myself and all our colleagues, you know, we're dealing with, with we're dealing with the same things you all are. You know, the the stress of the pandemic, the, you know, what it's meant for our families. I mean, I know seven people who've died in in the course of of the pandemic, you know, this is, this is not fake. You know, I didn't even, by the way, I didn't even show you the stories that we did commemorating those who've died in the pandemic. We did, you know, we really wanted to memorialize those stories and make them not just numbers, you know, uh, you know, those stories are stressful to do. And, you know, and my colleagues and I, of course, we've been accused of all sorts of things. I, I can assure you that you know, if you were to go through, you know, the stories that I've done throughout my career, you know, there are politicians on both sides of the ledger who've sometimes not been pleased about what we've, re we've reported, you know, we're, we undertake tremendous financial costs and manpower when we litigate Freedom of Information Act requests. So we have several requests right now, you know, like the one we won yesterday where we've had to go to court. Um, this takes a lot of time and energy, um, you know, so thank you. We, we appreciate the support. I would also encourage young people that I know to think about this profession because it's just critical to our country. Yeah, one of the great things that I'm, I'm fortunate to do is I get to teach at uh, investigative reporting at, at CUNY's Graduate School of Journalism. Of course, all our classes are by Zoom I've yet to meet any of my students this fall in person, uh, but they're doing great work. It's 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 incredible, to, you know, to see you know to see the next generation of students. You know, I look at students of mine who've you know who've gone on to careers at the Washington Post, at the New York Times. I've had you know students you know covering elections right now in Wisconsin, um, in you know doing investigative reporting in Seattle, you know in Los Angeles. So. Uh, you know, again, thank you. And I, I, it's great to see those who are younger entering our profession and seeing some of the work that they're doing. You know, it gives me great hope that, you know, that there really are more reporters out, you know, entering our profession who really will, you know, without fear or favor, dig deep into the subjects that are important for our nation. Are any given death threats because of the, you know, by doing this, have you known any throughout the last six months when things were so fired up? Yeah, I mean, certainly we've gotten we've gotten we've gotten threats. You know, uh, um, most of them are vague. Uh, you know, so, you know, you'll you'll get beaten up. You know, the people will take care of you. Those kinds of things. You know, not the specific threat of. Uh, you know. Um, but it's clearly my colleagues, you know, there, you know, there have been more than 40 journalists in the course of covering the protests who've been, uh, who've been beaten up by police, um, uh, including uh, NBC colleagues uh, in Minneapolis covering peaceful protests. Um, uh, 
uh, uh, I'll leave you to go read the stories about this, but, um, uh, you know, well, one of my colleagues was, uh, uh, several colleagues have been, have been shot by police. Uh, and there's one news photographer who was blinded by uh, rubber bullets fired by police. So, uh, um, yeah, no, it's, uh, 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 How do they protect themselves? Do they have protective gear when they go into this? this yeah, show? so it's a great question. So the reporters are clearly wearing badges saying press, you know, giant badges. Um, they're with camera crews. It's really obvious that these are journalists. You know, you can look at footage in, like in Nashville, you could see uh, reporters that are standing off in the cordoned area set aside for media. And, uh, and there are police who are patrolling the streets. You know, the protesters are, protesters are to the left, the press are to the right. And you could see a uh, riot squad, police riot squads, instead of facing the protesters, they turn around, see journalists and then fire on the journalists. You know, there's- oh, this is terrible. There are several instances of that and you can see the video of that. And, and yes, there, there are colleagues of mine who've been hurt. Um, yeah. Uh, I, okay, I hate to even ask this question. Everybody's been waiting for what's going to happen. Yeah. Like only waiting for the ball to drop on New Year's Eve, only in a different way, the worst way. Um, do you think things will be in control in the next few weeks because of this election? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's really the, the question, you know, a lot of people have, particularly after yesterday's uh, um, White House press announcement. Um, but I think you've seen I mean, I, I don't like to get into the prognostication business. Uh, it's a dangerous thing to do. Um, the, there, there are clearly voices on both sides of the aisle who are clearly saying, let the votes be counted. Um, and, you know, I think everyone should, should know that those who people who are counting the votes are from both sides of the aisle. I mean, the entire uh, voting counting system in Georgia, for instance, is... Uh, is is overseen by elected Republicans, you know. So, this this is vote counting is is one of the sacred things in our democracy. Um, and, uh, and I wasn't thinking about yeah. that. I was concerned that a few days ago you see Macy's boarded up in New York. Do you oh know right, you yeah. The, in other words, like everyone is. This had never happened before. Right. I think a lot of people were just concerned that that there I mean, we all got notices about, you know, what to do if we were reporters out in the field um, as election night rolled out. So there were all kinds of contingency plans how to go about reporting about this. But of course, you know, people were boarding up because of everything we've seen in, you know, this summer. Um, and there clearly were voices uh, saying that there would be um, you know, threats. And I, I think you, you've probably seen the video out of Detroit, which is probably the, you know, was, was of concern. Um, fortunately, that did not escalate. Um, Thank you. Yeah. But you never, worked, yeah. you never would think that a, being a reporter is as dangerous as being a policeman. <laughs> They're both dangerous. I mean, I, you know, oh. you know, sometimes people think that journalists have this antagonistic relationship with police. I mean, we respect everybody who's doing their job. We ask questions and, you know, there are many police who sit down and, and talk with us to explain what they're thinking and why they're doing. It's, um, you know, uh, um, so yes, we're gonna ask hard questions, but, you know, it's always done with respect. And the same thing goes with any administration. You know, I've certainly been involved in, in issues, you know, with previous administrations on both sides of the aisle. And, you know, uh, you know, we ask our questions with respect. Uh, I also wanted to ask you about the $100 million that was donated very nicely to big corporations instead of the small businesses, how they maneuvered it, the hotels and, and whatnot. Yeah. Did they, how much of that was given back, would you know? The percentage we, don't, we don't know. Actually, the one thing that'll be interesting is with this FOIA fight that we've had is we may actually get insight into that. 
Um, so no, no one knows because those records have been being had been kept secret. And again, these are records that in the past had been made public. So we're hoping that once we get these records, we could answer questions like that. Because yeah, some big business could make their money, and the small businesses could go out of business because yeah, of it. I, yeah, and you know, I mean, in the past, by the way, you know, the 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 information that's being disclosed has never been an impediment to people getting these loans before. So, well, I you thought know, a hopeful note was uh, so many of the reporters were saying that the people counting the votes were both Democrats and Republicans and yeah. working together in harmony. And, and by the way, uh, you know, observers, both both campaigns, both the, the Biden and Trump campaigns do have had observers the whole time in the rooms. It's not right. like they're not allowed to observe it, just so we're clear about observation too. Yeah, but I'm sorry, Mira. Myra, it was just uh, disheartening to see in Arizona the the threatening crowd. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, yeah, I'm just hoping it it's just hard to look ahead. We'll yeah. see. Yeah. And you hope that you're safe and your family is safe. Well, and that you, the country is safe. <laughs> you as well and everyone on this phone call. Are there any more, any other questions? Of, you know, people on phones or people who have their, their uh, who are muted? I'd love to, you know, if, other, if there are other questions out there, I'd love to have them. Can you give us any happy news? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can, I can give you some happy news. Sure. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, give me one second. I'll I'll pull up something. <laughs> I'm trying to think of it. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, we work on projects long and long and short. Uh, and uh, um, I was fortunate enough to. Uh, I'm going to screen share again if it's still possible. I can. Okay. Uh, I'd actually, myself and uh, about 20 other writers and journalists, we worked on a book uh, over the last couple of years and it was actually published in August and became a bestseller on, the, on Amazon's uh, sports journalism and sports essay uh, bestseller list. So uh, totally unrelated, it was a book about losers. It was, uh, it was about people who, uh, um, had uh, been on the uh, other side of the scoreboard, not the winning side. And so we all had proposed various essays or stories we wanted to do. And uh, so if you want happy news, it was that our, our book became a bestseller. Um, it was about losers, but they actually gave some, the people we spoke with gave incredibly insightful um, uh, looks into the world of sport. So. Uh, um, my wife's been been reading the the essays and and she's she's really liked it. Um, I profiled uh, I like to run marathons and I profiled a, a marathoner who lost the Boston Marathon in one of the closest races ever. And I spent hours on the uh, uh, interviewing him and uh, and that that essay was was highlighted by the New York Times and a couple others as like a notable essay to read in this collection. So. Uh, some of, the, some of the essays were written are, are, are oldies but goodies. One was actually written by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle of Sherlock Holmes fame. Another was written by Gay Talese, you know, one of the great narrative writers of all time. Um, and in the collection is, uh, is, uh, is some work that I did. Um, so, uh, you know, if you're looking for a, a stocking stuffer for the holidays, uh, you know. I can't wait to buy it, and I also want the library to buy it. Michael, we have to buy it. You never told <laughs> Andy, that was a secret. You never told me about it. I was, you know, I was just working on it on the side, and I, I was, you know, here we were working on all these other uh, stories this summer, and all of a sudden the book was released, and it was nice to uh, to see the reception that it got, the the nice reviews it was getting, and and that uh, and the attention it got. So, uh, 
So uh, it's, on, it's on Penguin Books, um, you know, a notable book publisher. Um, and, uh, and, you know. Uh, Can you just show the cover? The cover is great. Can you describe the cover? Sure. Uh, yeah, for those who cannot see the cover, it's a, uh, it's, uh, it's a tennis player. Um, and she's at the baseline. And there's uh, a ball behind her that clearly she didn't get to. And she's just holding her record her, ra her racket as she's like on the court, curled up in grief, crying, uh, <laughs> crying. <laughs> you know. So, and the title of the book is Losers Dispatches from the Other Side of the Scoreboard. So, uh, I, and- I uh, read it, it looks fabulous. Yeah, so uh, ho hopefully uh, for those who- uh, Andy, you know, that's so wonderful to leave us with this kind of book because they're not losing a lot because they're in your book, so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's- uh, Thank you so much. Thank you all. Be safe, be healthy and happy. And pleasure. Good seeing you, everyone. Be good, everyone. You too. Great, bye-bye.